Hello and welcome to this Foxy Openings DVD. I'm International Master Andrew Martin and I'm going to be your host for the next couple of hours. And I'm going to teach you how to play the Stonewall Dutch. Now so many of us have busy lives these days. We want to improve at chess, we want to maximise our results, we want to get better. Yet there's always something that gets in the way of our improvement. We can't find the time to put the necessary work in. This is where we need a stable, economic and effective opening repertoire. We need openings that are easy to learn and easy to play and furnish us with good results in the shortest possible time. I believe the Stonewall fits into the easy to learn and easy to play category. We're going to see grandmasters going down left, right and centre to Black's solid opening choice. I believe the Stonewall is an opening which will be learned quickly and played right away. So on with the show, it's time to learn the Stonewall Dutch. The Stonewall system of the Dutch defence begins after the following moves. White plays d4, black goes f5. There are various ways to get to our desired position, but uh, it will come to the same in the end. White fianchettos his king bishop in approved fashion. And black sets up the Stonewall by erecting a uh, light squared pawn chain. He plays his pawn up to d5, his pawn up to c6. And now the bishop in the modern style sits harmoniously with the rest of the pieces on d6. Obviously black can develop his bishop to e7, um, which Bob Binnick liked. But bishop d6, in my view, is a perfectly playable move. Now we're going to give white one more move and black castles. This would be a typical position. And uh, you'll get many positions like this in the stone wall. And I see three separate ideas which black has to consider in this position. Firstly and foremostly, black is planning to grip the e4 square. This is absolute key in the Dutch defence. White will try to break black's hold on that square. Black is trying to dominate there. Now, it's not necessary to occupy that square, although certainly black will be thinking about moves like knight e4 the whole game. We'll see an example in our first game where black plays knight e4 with decisive effect just at the right moment. At any rate, knight e4 is always an idea you've got to keep in mind. Second thing I, I would like to draw your attention to is black's queen. Where should the queen go to best effect in this system? Sometimes when white plays a move like b3, he's thinking about moves like bishop a3 to exchange off the dark square bishops in order that he can dominate the e5 square. Well, if that's the case, then black's queen often sits best at e7, where she prevents bishop to a3. Obviously, white can play a move like a4. I mean, that has been seen many times. Then black will go b6 and get his queenside pieces out with the idea of bishop b7 and knight bd7. Which brings me to my next point. Um, what if white doesn't play b3 in this position? Well, black has other ideas with the queen. She can slide out via e8 to h5 and aid a possible kingside attack. This is another manoeuvre with the queen, which is quite characteristic of the Dutch and must always be kept in mind. Taking play on a little bit further, um, let's say white plays knight bd2 in this position. Well now, black has to think about the development of his queenside pieces. This is the third idea I want to bring to your attention at this early stage. What is black going to do with these pieces on the queen side? Well, one way to solve this problem is to play the stone wall in the modern style with b6. This is a very coherent way to develop black's forces um, and a good way too. The pieces come out in apple pie order and black follows up with the plan something like rook a c8, queen e7 and then the key move c5. It was Bronstein who introduced this idea into modern play back in the 1950s uh, from his world championship match against Bob Binnick. And it's a nice fluid way to play the position with black. So just to summarise, the stonewall in the modern guise with bishop d6 is very solid. Uh, black gets to the initial position after castles. He's then looking out for three things. One, where to put his queen. Uh, two, how to develop the queen side pieces. And three, exactly when to play the move c5. Or how to occupy the square knight e4 at the right moment. Keep those ideas in mind. And you can almost start playing the stone wall right away. 
Now, the stone wall is not an opening which can be understood in terms of variations and long streams of analysis. And this is why it suits um, a lot of players, especially at club level. It's an opening which can be understood in terms of ideas. And <coughs> we're going to see a classic stone wall demolition now, um, where Black plays an exceptionally good game. It comes from the Realton Cup in 2002, and playing white is a guy called Nordstrom, playing black, the Grandmaster Ulibin. Okay, well, look, we quickly get the contours of the stone wall coming on the board, with black erecting his solid pawn formation in the centre, and then developing his bishop harmoniously to the d6 square. There are obviously different ways to um, set up the stone wall, but black may put his bishop on e7, and um, bishop d6, I would say, is probably the most harmonious. It covers the e5 square, which of course is the the key square which white tries to occupy and dominate in the stone wall. And um, black makes room for the queen, if necessary, to come to e7, which actually happens very quickly in this game because white plays b3. And with b3, white introduces the positional idea of bishop a3. You've always got to watch out for this in the stone wall. The point of bishop a3 is to exchange off the dark square bishops. Once the dark square bishops are exchanged, white can play to dominate e5. So this is a very important positional idea, which black has always got to bear in mind. And for this reason, black played queen to e7, which um, not only stops white's idea of bishop a3, but it also, in the uh, longer run, prepares to play e5 if necessary. If black can break the shackles on e5 by playing e5 himself, then you know it sometimes makes sense to be able to do this. Bishop b2. White's idea has been thwarted, so um, he plays to stop e5 himself. And now comes a very interesting move. Pawn to b6. This is quite in the modern style of the stone wall. Um, and in order to understand what black is doing, let's retrace our steps. Just one move. Now, in the stone wall, black has achieved a position of really harmonious development right in the opening. And, um, well, if he castles in this position, then, you know, this is another another one of the main lines. When I look at this position, I see good things for black, and I see bad things. The problem for black, as I see it, is his queenside pieces. What are we going to do with the queenside pieces? We'll encounter this problem time and time again in the stone wall, and it's something you have to keep in mind all the time. How is black going to get those pieces out? There are various ways. Well, clearly it's possible for black to play a move like b6. I mean, let's just take play on a little bit here. We'll give back a, a white another move. Clearly it's possible for black to play a move like b6 in this situation. And then develop his pieces along the following lines. Bishop to b7 or bishop a6. Knight comes to d7. And then black is looking to free himself by playing c5. So in the style of the Queen's Indian, perhaps... Um, this is one of the modern ways to play the stone wall. Going back to knight bd2, an old-fashioned way might be to play the interesting move bishop d7. This is another way to handle the position, and the point of it is to go bishop e8, and then to liberate the bishop by bringing the piece out to h5. This is uh, quite in order in the stone wall. Uh, obviously the bishop on c8 is black's problem piece, and he's just going to try and get rid of it by uh, perhaps even playing bishop takes f3 on the next turn. It's not at all easy for white to work up an advantage against this plan. So what I'm saying is that black has various ways to get his queenside pieces uh, developed. And if we go back to Nordstrom versus Ulibin now, perhaps this helps to explain the move b6. Ulibin is going through with the modern idea of the stone wall. Either bishop b7 or bishop a6. And he is... Um, seeking to remedy the idea of this, this bad bishop on, on c8 immediately. So, queen to c2 by white. And black castles. Now, a typical example of, of white playing routine moves in this position, and perhaps uh, getting nothing from the opening, uh, goes as follows. Black can play bishop b7 here. White plays knight bd2. I think you'll agree with me that is perfectly logical. Black castles. Now white plays knight e1. 
he wants to redeploy this knight to d3 and then play the other knight to f3 to dominate e5 well all as recommended in the theory books but black can get a very good position here by playing a move like a5 and then knight to a6 this is another way of developing the queen side pieces white goes through with his plan black brings a rook to the c file the instant the white queen goes on to c2 black should be looking out for moves of this type because um, it's quite embarrassing for white to have the queen on the c file in this position and then after knight f3 black breaks free with c5 this represents uh, ideal play for black in the opening and um, gives him an excellent position white's queen is in the wrong spot black's maybe even slightly ahead in development in this position due to the fact he's got his rook on c8 and uh, white has no corresponding move uh, ready and this was the game Achang versus Goloshapov versus uh, St. Petersburg 2000 um, and black is probably slightly better already so it just goes to show going back to the game Nordstrom versus Ulibin it is possible for white to fall into a bad position without having played a bad move in this opening so Nordstrom played in this position knight to c3 now um, of course white can play knight bd2 in this position and then I think bishop b7 knight e5 a5 knight d3 knight a6 would make perfect sense if white tries to shut black down by going rook fc1 rook a c8 and now c5 black takes and leaves himself with a central pawn majority after d takes c5 bishop c7 bishop e5 and now knight b8 black recuperates by fighting for the e5 square with a subsequent knight bd7 and achieves good play which brings us back one more time to Nordstrom versus Ulibin and white plays knight c3 but once that knight comes to c3 black can think about the move bishop a6 putting pressure on the pawn at c4 this pawn is now unprotected and white's got to think about it this will be a typically aggressive move in the stone wall and um, black is not taking away the idea of c5 by no means because in this game white plays knight e5 protecting his pawn and black goes rook c8 anyway so once you see that move you start to understand that c5 is coming with an excellent position for black well c takes d5 white starts to panic he sees the rook on the same file as his queen and he doesn't really know what to do about it in a sense black is refusing white's entire opening play by these means so i'm not sure about c takes d5 it seems to me to open the c file uh, and black is the only person who is in good shape to use that file i mean probably white should bite the bullet here and play a move like f4 or even keep the tension here by playing rook ac1 well that must be said that you know black has a pretty good game in this position um, well just by getting his knight out knight bd7 black's fully developed and uh, has excellent chances but c takes d5 as i say is not wise white uh, white's got some problems now on the c file after c takes d5 rook fc1 was played knight bd7 and now white played knight to d3 again possibly unwise white's playing all the book moves as they say but in the wrong order um, I think the position is, is too dangerous already for white to start playing casual moves I think what white's got to do is recognize he's got nothing from the opening whatsoever just take on d7 go queen d1 and more or less play for a draw here by trying to exchange some pieces on the c file maybe moving the knight on um, c3 and then just chopping all the rooks off or trying to although of course Black has a very good position. So let's see what happened after knight to d3. Black played his knight into e4. Uh, a key square in the stone wall. If black can occupy this square favourably, then he will get a very good game. White moved out of the pin. Black brought up the reinforcements. Rook c2. And suddenly, out of nowhere, black obtains a dangerous initiative with knight g4. In a sense, this is a model game to start our investigation. You don't need to see many Stonewall games. You just need to see the right games. And this is, this is one of the right games. White makes no appreciable mistake, yet gets absolutely hammered in this game. It's almost as if Black managed to 
combine all the Stonewall ideas in one game. And uh, knight g4, well obviously that's putting pressure on the king side here. And white has to guard an entire complex of squares here. Um, notably the, uh, the e3 square, the f2 square and the h2 square. So he goes e3. Queen f6. Rook a c1. Queen h6. Again, pressure mounts on h2. White defends himself. And now black puts the boot in. With the excellent move, knight takes e3. This really is a splendid move. And um, refutes white's entire plan. Suddenly, white's kingside looks very weak. Um, he's got problems on, on g3. He goes knight f2 in this position. Queen takes g3. And in an instant, the entire kingside has been completely demolished. Black is threatening queen h2 check. So white hastens to exchange off one of the attacking pieces. F takes e4. The rather desperate knight takes e4. Queen h2 check. King f2. Rook f8 check. King e1. And now queen g1 check. After which black starts to pick off all of white's pieces uh, with check and has a mating attack to boot. So a really excellent game there by Ulibin and um, the perfect demonstration of Black's chances in the stone wall. White did nothing wrong, uh, well on the face of it, but got absolutely hammered. My next example comes from an open tournament in Kharkov in the Ukraine, played in the year 2000, where once again using the stone wall Black makes chess look like a very easy game. Playing white in this game is a guy called Disky, and playing black is a guy called Colkin. And once again, we see the normal stone wall coming on the board after d4. This time, black plays the e6 move order. Of course, if you go this way with the stone wall, you've got to be prepared to play the French defence if white goes e4. But white plays c4. Not every white player is ready to readjust into an e4 system. Black plays f5, knight f3, knight f6, g3, d5, bishop g2. Bishop d6, castles, and now c6. And once again, black has to face the move b3. Well, with bishop a3 coming up, queen e7 is a good move. And now white plays his bishop to b2. There is, believe it or not, a trap in this position when white plays a4. And what black castles allowing bishop a3 black. Bishop takes a3. Rook takes a3. And now knight e4 is quite an interesting move. And um, the point of this move is that if white goes a5 in this position, rather stupidly, black wins material after knight c3. I mean, clearly in this position after knight e4, white has to go queen c1. But again, black is in good shape fixing the b4 square after a5. And black's plan here is to go knight a6 and then knight b4 with a good game. Just retracing play even further to rook takes a3. I mean, it may be that black can break with c5 immediately. There's no reason why black should stand in a passive position on the queen side in a situation of this type. You can think about active moves. So I think what I'm saying is black is not consigned to passivity in the modern stone wall. Not at all. So white play bishop b2. Black castles. Now um, it is possible that b6 is slightly more accurate in this position. And if white goes queen c1, renewing the threat of bishop a3... Black just goes bishop b7. The point is that white's play is very slow. So white does get the opportunity to exchange off the dark square bishops in this position. But, um, you know, black is in good shape after c5. This would be a typically dynamic way to handle the stone wall. And black breaks free. White pressure is being brought to bear on white's central uh, formation. And if he tries to saddle black with hanging pawns after uh, c takes d5, e takes d5 and then e3... Well, black can go knight bd7, knight c3 and castle. And there's no real way for, for white to mount effective pressure against those hanging pawns. Black can stick his knight in on e4 thematically. And if white brings his rook f to d1, then queen f6 is a good move. Queen b2. And now a5. This again represents a very good uh, formation for black from the opening. Black is in very good shape. He's ready to develop his rooks. With a5, he's nailed down the queen side. He stopped white from freeing himself with b4. 
And now, perhaps an ideal deployment for the Black Rooks will be something like Rook A to C8 when the game continues and Black is in excellent fettle. Going back to the game Disky versus Colkin, Black, however, castled. Well, White played Knight BD2, very natural. I mean, maybe Queen C1 uh, would be slightly more active in this position, after which I suppose Black will go B6 and get into a very similar position to, to that which we've just examined. Knight BD2, however, B6, Knight E5, Bishop B7, Knight D3, Knight BD7, Knight F3, and now Rook FD8, Knight E5, and now Rook AC8 completes the Black setup, deploying both his Rooks. Meanwhile, the White Rooks are still inactive. Is it any wonder, in a position of this type, the Black is ready to seize the initiative? When you've got an advantage in development, you must try to seize the initiative in chess. You can't just sit back and let things happen. Otherwise, White will catch up. It seems to me that, even at the start of this DVD, White is having problems finding the best squares for his major pieces. Certainly here, White's gone through with the prescribed book recipe of dominating E5, but Black has developed his forces very comfortably and is ready to seize the initiative with moves like C5 or maybe A5. For instance, White played A4 here trying to get things going on the Queen side. Black freezes the position with A5 and then puts his knight in on E4. And by these means, gives himself excellent chances. Well, White went Queen E2. I suppose E3 did vacate that square for the Queen. Bishop takes E5, a very unstereotyped and excellent move, converting the C5 square into uh, an excellent post for the, uh, the Black Knight. Bishop comes to A6, noting that there are a lot of white pieces on the diagonal. Rook A C1, and now Black brings his Knight up to C5. All right, white pins that knight. Bishop uh, pins knight. Queen comes to c7. Knight takes c5. Knight takes c5. Bishop takes c5. White decides that he can't tolerate a knight on c5, but in fact, all this achieves is to just expose the pawn on b3 to attack. And summarising this position, we see that, that white is worse, much worse in this position. He's got a weak pawn on b3 with nothing to show for it. Uh, paradoxically, it's the, the, the black light square bishop that is the more active of the two. White's bishop on g2 is just biting on granite, we say. And for black, the plan is very easy. White has to defend the pawn on e5. Black just builds up systematically on the pawn at b3. Again, making chess look like a very easy game. All the pieces come to the party, piling up on that weak pawn. C takes d5. White thinks he sees a weak pawn in black's camp on c5. But I think white is strategically busted anyway. Bishop c4. Just going back one move. Could white have done better? I'm not sure. I think that pawn on b3 is right for the plucking. And, uh, well, the well, white's bishop is useless. You know, in, in tandem with the weakness of the pawn on b3, this really does seal white's fate. So rook takes c5. An interference move. Bishop c4. Black wins the exchange. White's got to surrender the exchange here. But of course, there's no coming back from queen takes e3. Rook b2 is the threat, so white has to surrender the queens. Well, it's a mop-up job now. Black just takes all the queenside pieces off. So, the exchange of the pawn down, white resigns. Another excellent example of the modern stonewall in action, where the plan with b6 and bishop b7 worked to great effect. Well, now comes a very instructive uh, Stonewall Demolition, yet another one. Uh, it's the game Helgi Olafsson, Grandmaster, versus Seaman Agdestein, also one of Norway's strongest ever players, Grandmaster. This game was played in Reykjavik in 1987. Uh, the age of these games should not daunt us. Uh, it's okay to look at older games, especially an opening like the Stonewall, where, you know, theory does not date. Why well, it's hardly going to be able to refute... Um, Black's very solid and harmonious setup uh, by playing sharp lines. It's just a question of how to play the position with black. And this game will conclusively demonstrate the latent potential of black's bishop on c8. It seems to me that this is black's problem piece in the stone wall. We'll just see how black deploys this bishop in our coming game to great effect. 
Again, we see White employing the popular plan with b3, and Black stops Bishop a3 immediately by playing Queen e7. Bishop b2, b6. This is the um, this is the best way I think to develop Black's queenside pieces here. Um, Black just plays his bishop to b7, and he's always thinking about playing the move c5 thereafter. C5 both activates the uh, the bishop and puts pressure on white's center. Well, having spent so much time setting up this trade of dark square bishops, Olofsson goes through with it, and then he plays his queen out to a3. Well, it seems to me that if the queens come off in this position, then white may have chances for a very small edge, based around the fact that knight e5 occupies a hole, whereas knight e4 for black would only occupy an outpost. The difference between an outpost and a hole is that whereas a piece may move into an outpost, it can be ejected from the outpost with pawns. For instance, white can move his knight on f3 and then go f3. But if white can sink a knight into e5, that knight could be uh, stationed there permanently because black can't get rid of the knight using a pawn. So for that reason, and going back to queen a3 now, Agdestein plays the ambitious move c5. Yes, white could saddle black with hanging pawns after d takes c5, but black is confident that his dynamic chances in this position will compensate for his structural weaknesses. I mean, are these pawns strong or weak? With hanging pawns, we, we understand that it's good to keep lots of pieces on the board. The more pieces that are exchanged, the weaker the hanging pawns can become. But Agnestein understands that, well, he can reinforce his pawns by playing his knight b to d7, and after rook fd1, he can get active chances by playing f4, after which black is looking to develop the initiative. Now, going back, rook fd1 seemed to me to be a very casual move. I mean, I think uh, white should probably stabilise the position after e3, just preventing black, for the time being, from playing f4. But, however, I think knight e4 gives black a decent game. This is a good moment to occupy e4, with the knight on c3 being unprotected, and if, if, if white goes knight takes e4, black recaptures with the f-pawn, both bringing his rook into the game on f8, and creating a lovely square on e5 for black's knight. It's rather ironic that in this line, black manages to occupy the e5 square himself with the knight. Normally that's white's terrain in the Dutch. So I think what I'm saying is, going back to the game, rook fd1 and now f4, that black has a pretty good game already. Well, rook a c1. You couldn't say that white is not playing good moves. I mean, this is a grandmaster playing white. He's just developing his army. And black takes time out on the queen side to prevent knight b5 with a6. Bishop h3 by white, trying to put pressure on e6. And now rook a e8. Well, black is in a position of full development. White goes rook c2. White's trying to put pressure on the black pawns at d5 and c5. But, you know, with rook c2, I'm not so sure he's he's going to succeed. I mean, white's probably going to win the pawn on c4. His plan, to go rook d c1, pawn takes d5, and then knight a4. Then the pawn on c5 is starting to look very weak. But, of course, this takes a long time. And black is ready with a quick attack after knight e4. Um to offset white's pressure against c5. Well, c takes d5. White's going through with his plan. Bishop takes d7. Yeah, this seems like a big concession, but actually, I think black is getting ready to sacrifice a piece on g3. Um, I think normal means, normal methods for white are not available in this position. Black's just simply threatening to go f takes g3, and then knight takes g3. After which... You know, with the queen on g3, white will have to worry about d4, and then suddenly the dark, the light square bishop comes into play with decisive effect. Something similar uh, happens to this in the game. White thinks he can grab a pawn on c5, but it doesn't work out too well. Rook takes c5. Well, white could, of course, play queen takes c5 in this position, but that loses to the skewering move, rook c8. So, rook takes c5. Rook takes e2, knight d4, trying to uh, 
plug the position by attacking the rook. I mean, I think the initiative is, is so strong here. If white plays b4, for instance, then d4, excellent move, unleashing the light square bishop. Rook takes d4, and now queen, take, uh, rook, queen takes d4, knight takes d4, rook e1 will be um, a typical disaster in this position. Uh, proof positive that the light square bishop of black in the stone wall is not always a bad piece. So knight d4 in the game. F takes g3. F takes g3. Queen f7. Well, but what is white going to do about f2? It's noticeable that white's queen on a3 is completely out of the game here. White tried knight takes e2. Queen f2 check. King h1. D4 check. The final triumph of the light square bishop. And um, an object lesson really in how to get this piece into the game. Rook d5. Bishop d5. And that was that. Checkmate. Well if that game isn't proof positive that the light square bishop in the stone wall can be deployed effectively. I don't know what is. This was an excellent game by Agnes Stein which is worth playing through more than once. Um, where most of Black's thematic ideas were put into practice. So far we've discussed um, ways of developing the black queen side um, involving the move b6 and this time round we're going to see an alternative way of getting the queen side pieces out. We now come to the game Pavel Tregubov graded 2615 very strong grandmaster playing with the white pieces and he's playing against Ilyushin this game was played in the Russian championship in the year 2000 and um, in this particular game white decides to try and get the light the dark square bishops off immediately by playing bishop f4. This is um, a dangerous positional plan for black to have to combat and in this game we see Ilyushin adopting perhaps the best way uh, the best method against it. Well black takes on f4 doubling white's pawns. I think that's uh, a good way to play. I mean at, at least if white's going to dominate the e5 square in this position then black has some Something to bite on, if you like, with the white pawn structure. Although the pawns on f4 and d4 look strong, keeping control of e5, we'll see later on in this game that black has ways to try to dismantle this pawn chain. Well, Ilyushin castled. White brings his knight out to b, uh, knight b to d2. And now, the very interesting move, bishop d7. Uh, in this variation, uh, the bishop deployment via e8 to h5 is a very common idea. As white has weakened his king side slightly, it makes sense for black to direct his bishop uh, to the h5 square, where pressure can be brought to bear against white's slightly weakened king side. Queen b3. Tregubov notices that black has left b7 um, unprotected. Black moves in to cover this with queen to b6 and white goes rook fc1. I mean I think taking on b6 here only helps black. You've got to ask yourself in, in positions of this type, what am I getting for the exchange? Well white achieves precisely nothing with that exchange on b6. It makes it very easy for black to claim equality. The rook on a8 is brought into the game and um, knight e5 in this position would be answered by bishop e8. Black is getting ready to eject White's knight on e5 by playing knight b to d7, and the bishop can redeploy to h5, which is a very good square. So White decides to delay the queen exchange for the time being and play rook fc1, but of course the stable nature of Black's central pawn formation enables him to just get on with the thematic redeployment after bishop e8. Queen e3, attacking e6. Bishop f7, defending e6, rook a b1, queen comes to b4, more to get the queen back to the king side than anything else via e7, and white expands on the queen side with b4. a6, a4, you'll find when you play strong players in the stone wall that the queen side is a natural theatre of action for white. Thus, Black's got to be alert to moves like c5 and then b5 coming up. So how is black going to work, work out some chances against his natural plan? 
Well, he puts his knight on e4. Occupation rather than control in this instance. Black gets to grips with the knight on d2. Well, white doesn't want any pieces exchanged in this position. But black now brings his bishop out to h5. Knight a5. Not sure. I think that knight is on a suicide expedition to the, qu the queen side there. I mean, I think probably the knight should simply stay in the centre to help reinforce the defences on the king side. Bringing the knight away from the king side enables black to, first of all, defend himself and then go into action on the king side with bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, and now a very thematic move, which I referred to earlier, g5. Watch out for this move in the bishop f4 variation, and with it, black gets to grips with the white king side pawn formation. Basically, black's going to tuck his king away in the corner, and he's going to play on the g file. A very thematic and instructive way for black to handle this position. E3, trying to stabilise. King h8, f takes g5, knight takes g5, queen f4. Well, the queen tries to block black's attack, but in fact she's only stepping into the way of, uh, uh, of the move e5 here. Which can only help black's position. I mean, just going back, maybe white should play queen e2 in this position and just just to allow black to play f4. This is clearly going to be dangerous for white. But white has some survival chances in this position because um, you know it's going to take black a while to get his rook on a7 into the game. But uh, certainly after queen f4 and now e5, black is really getting his attack together. White's got to take. Black takes back with the knight, threatening a decisive family fork on d3. White goes h4. Hoping to buy black off. Black is not interested in being bought off. He just brings his knight into a, a very good central square. Rook d1 defending against the fork. Knight g6 hitting the queen. Queen h6. Knight takes h4. White's king side has been completely wiped out. White won f3. Black played knight g5. Noting that queen takes h4 in this position. Fails to knight takes f3 check. And black wins the white queen by means of a discovered attack. So king h1, parking his king in the corner. Knight h takes f3. Of course, white is completely lost now. His king side's shot to ribbons. Rook f1. Knight e5. Queen h5. And now knight g4. White resigns. Whatever plan white has come up with in this position to, to exchange off the dark square bishops has been completely refuted. So just going back to the opening one more time, let's return to the position after bishop d6 and just summarise black's ideas against bishop f4. Bishop f4 introduces a dangerous plan by white to exchange off dark square bishops and dominate the square uh, e5. This should be met by bishop takes f4, g takes f4, and now perhaps bishop d7 is a good move. With the pawn formation as it is, it makes sense for black to think about redeploying his queen's a bishop out to h5. After that, black is looking to play the moves knight e4 and eventually to get to grips with white's pawn formation via g5. As we have seen in this game, this can be very effective. The next game features another example of bishop f4. It's the game Valerie Grinev versus Alexander Moisienko and it was played in the Ukrainian Championship in Elushta back in 2004. As I say, these games do not date. Uh, the Stonewall is a permanent fixture, I would say. There are not uh, going to be uh, refutations of this opening coming in a hurry. And uh, instead, we've got a whole battery of positional plans which we have to deal with. And uh, here comes Bishop f4 once again. Well, we know what to do against that. We take on f4, we castle, and then we're thinking about ways of getting our queenside pieces out, notably the bishop via e8 to h5. Once white has weakened his kingside pawn formation there, the redeployment of this bishop to h5 makes perfect sense. It will make less sense for black to develop via b6 and bishop b7 in this scenario. Grinev played knight e5, bishop e8, queen comes to c2, 
and black plays his knight to d7. So black has found a very good way of developing his queenside pieces and now has distinct freedom of action. As is normal, when a side has more space, white refrains from exchanging pieces via knight d3, but this does not interrupt black's plan in any way, and he now plays bishop f5. In a situation like this, black is looking to follow up with ideas such as knight e4 and then g5. We know this from our last game, we've learned it. The king parks itself in the corner after g5, and then black is looking to play on the g-file. I believe you'll find this an effective counter to the bishop f4 variation. Well, white went bishop f3, queen e8, queen b3, bishop takes f3, knight takes f3, and now black picks up momentum by bringing his queen out to h5. Obviously, the knight on um, f3 is attacked, so white retreats with queen d1. But after d takes c4, black is already getting the upper hand in this game. White tries knight d to e5. Black takes, and then goes knight g4, forcing the trade of knights and the entry into a major piece ending after f takes g4 and then f3. I mean, white's got to play this freeing move because black was, black was coming out with ideas such as rook f6 and then rook h6, putting the question to the pawn on h2. So white's got to try and free himself. Okay, into the end game we go after g takes f3, queen takes f3, and now queen d5, centralising the queen. Major piece end games are all about activity. So black stations his queen as actively as possible. They're also about quality of past pawns rather than quantity of pawns. Black is looking at every stage to activate the queen side majority. White's got a central majority, but it's not so easy for white to play e4 because his d4 pawn will be hanging. So I think white is just a pawn down in this position. He's got to face facts. He's been outplayed. And Moisienko continues with rook a d8 and then c5, trying to destroy the white central pawn phalanx. Well, white is a pawn down. I mean, there's no doubt about it. If he goes rook g5 in this position, then I think it's, it's time for black to exchange off the queens and then take on d4. Another pawn down the drain. White has no compensation whatsoever. After a move like rook a g1, black can simply blot everything out with g6. So going back to the game and c5, probably white's got to take, queen takes c5, but now black's got an open highway into the black uh, into the white camp. The rook's coming down to d2. White tries to get active correctly with queen e4. He takes a risk, he figures his position is very bad, so he can afford to try ideas like rook g4 and hope that he can create some pressure here via the threat of queen takes e6. But black is not going to be bought off so easily. He allows white to play queen takes e6. He tucks his king in the corner. Rook a g1 because he's worked out that the counter attack is winning after queen e2 check. King comes to e4 and now the very well calculated move. Rook d3. Black gets his haymaker in first. And um, well white can't play rook takes g7. So if white has to play rook 1 g3 his whole setup doesn't make a great deal of sense. Black continues with counter-attacking moves, queen c2, well, direct attacking moves if you like, and now he's threatening to win the white queen with rook d6 discovered check. White grovels away, queen check on d1, king e4, queen h1 check, king e5, and now the winning move, rook d5 check. White resigns. His king is in the firing line if he plays queen takes d5. We have rook f5 check. A completely convincing way to finish. Obviously, if king takes f5, queen takes d5 is checkmate. If king d6, king e6, excuse me, queen takes d5 check and wins immediately. So, um, a game where black didn't even have to play g5 to get to grips with the white king. Um, another, another game which demonstrated that this plan of bishop e8, bishop uh, h5 is a good one against bishop f4. I firmly believe that the stone wall can be learned and played the same evening. I don't think you need to know an enormous amount of information to play this excellent opening. And the next game will conclusively demonstrate how dangerous the stone wall is 
in the right hands. It comes from the Manila Olympiad in 1992 and it's a game played between two super grandmasters. Playing white in this game is Alexei Shirov and playing black in this game Vasily Ivanchuk, two of the most dangerous attacking players in modern chess. The, the contours of the stone will quickly come on the board with white playing the main line after bishop g2 and now black plays our favourite move bishop d6 and this time around white plays b3. Well we know what to do with bishop a3 coming up, black plays queen e7, knight e5 and black castles. So Shirov has chosen as is typical of him a very direct way to occupy the e5 square. He brings across his knight to f3 to reinforce the e5 knight and now black brings his knight into e4. So black is trying to counter white's domination of e5 with some ideas of his own. Knight d3. What is white's plan in this position? Well if it's, if it's able to uh, be put into practice it's a very effective one. White's plan is to put the knight on f3 into e5. After that white will play to get rid of black's knight with f3 himself. Shortly after white hopes to completely dominate the centre by playing e4 and black must fight against this plan tooth and nail in the stone wall. The square e4 is black's property in the stone wall and he must not allow white to dominate that square. If white ever gets the move e4 in against the stone wall then you know black can really sign his own death warrant. So that's the good thing about what white is doing. I think the bad news for white is it takes an awful long time for, for white to put this plan into effect and black can use that time to develop his queenside pieces. So Evanchuk goes b6 and then bishop b7. He's getting ready to answer a move like f3 with c5 at the right moment, freeing up his game. Note that f3 weakens the dark squares on white's king side slightly so hitting at the dark squares with c5 would make perfect positional sense. I mean it may well be just going back to the position after knight e4 that bishop f4 was perhaps a slightly more effective way to put the idea of dominating the centre into practice. I think after that possibly knight takes e5, bishop takes e5 and then bishop a3 as suggested by Evanchuk will be the best way for black to proceed. Black retains his dark square bishop and he prepares b6, bishop b7, and then c5 with unclear play. Which brings us back to our game, knight d3, b6, knight fe5, bishop b7, knight takes e5, queen takes, knight takes d7, queen takes d7, and now root 1 chess by Shirov, f3. But it may be already that this is a mistake. Um, I'm not so sure I like that move. I think probably white should play bishop f4 again and then black can choose. I don't think he wants to change the dark square bishop in this position. He can choose between retreating his bishop to e7, maybe putting it out on a3, or even perhaps going through with the move c5. Black has ample choice after bishop f4. But after f3, black retreats, and now he's looking forward to c5, which is why white moves to stop c5 by playing that move himself. He doesn't want to bring the bishop on b7 to life yet, but in so doing, in playing this move, he loosens his grip on e5, and black is now able to expand in the centre. He takes on c5. Now white has an unenviable choice. If he takes with the pawn, and then puts his bishop on b2, black plays queen e7. Now if white wants to stop e5 in this position, he's got to play the radical move f4, which would leave a big juicy hole on uh, e4 for a black knight to occupy, maybe even straight away. OK, this position is probably equal, but uh, it seems to me that black's pawn formation is more compact. Going back to the game, perhaps this is why white took with a knight, but of course Ivanchuk loses no time in taking the centre after bishop takes knight and then e5. And well, Ivanchuk has basically forced Shirov into a position he doesn't like. Shirov is a fantastic attacker. I think he's less certain as a player. And, you know, we're saying this about a super grandmaster when he's on the defensive. So, 
I think White now commits a mistake, e4. He opens up the position, and uh, this can only benefit Black. Going back, I think White should simply play e3 and try and stabilise things with Bishop b2. OK, he's a bit worse because, you know, Black has very good activity for his pieces. He can easily activate that light square Bishop. He can, again, easily centralise his rook. He can play his Queen to e7. Then he can expand in the centre. But at least this would be stable for White. e4, meanwhile... Well, this is not great. Bishop a6. And now black is really on the case in this position. Uh, white has some problems on the f-file. Now in the game, obviously Shirov understands this. Shirov plays rook e1. If he went rook f2, black opens up for business straight away with f takes e4. And then knight takes e4. Uh, this move looks impossible at first sight after bishop takes e4. But then rook takes f2. King takes f2. Rook f8 check is excellent for black. Given that bishop f3... Is answered by e4. And if after rook f8, king g2, we have rook f1, oh dear, queen d2, and now queen f7, which gives black a completely decisive attack in this position. Um, this really is unpleasant for white. If he plays bishop b2, we just take on uh, e4, and uh, this is very strong for black. So going back to this position, Shiroff obviously understands that the f file could become a problem, so he plays rook e1. Black takes on e4 and plays d4, establishing a wonderful passed pawn. And what is noticeable for me about this position is the immobility of the white queenside pieces. Well, white went queen d2, hoping to defend with his queen. I mean, I think a4 was probably a slightly better move, intending rook a2. This would have given white slightly more chances to defend against the impending black attack. But uh, white would still have problems here. Um, black has plenty of play, for instance as in the game after knight g4, and then just go h5, something like this, followed by doubling the rooks on the f-file. Something similar happens in the game. Knight g4, bishop h3, h5, after which white's pieces are paralysed and completely unable to offer any resistance to black's straightforward plan of attack, which is essentially to triple the major pieces on the f-file. Uh, rook a8, the rook's coming up to e6. Quite what white is doing with that dark square bishop is, is beyond me. White tries to defend himself with bishop f1, but now Ivanchuk moves him for the kill with knight f2, and then queen f3. Completely decisive. White resigns. Well, games like this make the stone wall look like an excellent opening. It really confirms to me that you do not need an enormous amount of information with the stone wall. You just need a few ideas. And uh, the way black played here was really excellent. He took the centre when he could. He fought against White's plan of dominating e5 effectively, and then he moved in for the kill with a big attack at the end. Excellent stuff. And don't forget, this was Alexei Shirov going down with White. My next game comes from the Championship of Argentina, played back in 2002, and it's between Garcia Palermo, Grandmaster playing White, and F. Peralta, who's graded 2490. And... Um, it features what I would call an obvious way of playing for white, which a lot of club players might use. That's the immediate jab with c5. White tries to gain space on the queen side in a very ambitious fashion, after bishop c7 and then b4. As I've mentioned before on this, um, this video, the queen side is white's natural theatre of action in the stone wall. So, what could be more logical than to press forward on that side of the board right away? Well, it turns out that by releasing the tension on the queen side by playing c5, to a certain degree, white has freed black hands in the centre. And so, it makes sense for black now to think about the move e5 to fight against white's domination of that square. So, that's why black plays knight bd7 and queen e7 in, that, in this game. He wants to expand in the centre with e5. Now Garcia Palermo seems completely okay with this. He plays knight b3, allowing black to expand, and of course Peralta takes the opportunity. So if we retrace to queen e7, you know, this sets me thinking, well, what happens after knight e5? Well, the trouble with knight e5 is that after knight takes e5 and then knight d7, Black's grip, White's grip on the position is not quite secure. He's got to take time out to protect his pawn 
and now black jabs at the white pawn chain by playing b6. And this really, I think, refutes white's entire setup. White's probably got to take on b6. And now after a takes b6, black is in very good shape. The proud white pawn chain on the queen side has been completely demolished and black is ready to expand with c5. Moreover, he hasn't had to work to get his rook on a8 into the game. So, by systematically preparing e5, black has managed to negate white's entire opening plan. Let's retract our steps now to knight to b3. e5 proves very effective in this game. White can only think about trading pieces, and that's exactly what he does. At least he manages to get the dark square bishop off the board, and now he plays e3. What he's hoping for, of course, is that in this position, his light square bishop is going to be more effective than black's bishop on c8, and that, you know, hopefully by pushing pawns on the queen side, a4, b5, he's going to get the initiative there. So that prompts white's next move, queen to d4. And of course, black should avoid the exchange of queens in this position. I think after queen takes d4, knight takes d4, not only does the white knight come to a perfect square, um, but white is in very good shape now to effect his plan of a4 and b5. But if black keeps the queens on with queen e7, and this is exactly what Peralta did, well, I think he's got plenty of counterplay on the horizon. Bishop e8. Well, I think there are alternatives here. I mean, g5 is also a move here. Um, when there there are mutual chances in this position, I would say. Black is looking to perhaps play rook a8, knight e4, and then f4. That's one plan. And if white tries to stop black with f4, then white goes, black goes h6. And white can be distracted from his normal attacking plan by, for instance, simply attacking e3 after a move like rook a, e8, with knight g4 to follow. But anyway, in the game, black played bishop e8, white went rook f e1, and now Peralta put his knight in on e4. f3. Well, white is getting very ambitious, you know, he was playing on the queen side a moment ago, now he plays f3. Black is happy to retreat, and there's a target on e3 to aim at. White moves his queen out of the way, Black goes rook c8, a prophylactic move, and then a6, hoping to take the sting out of the move b5. Knight comes into d4, bishop d7, pawn up to h4. Knight f7, e4, d takes e4, f takes e4, and now we reach a critical moment in the game where black plays the thematic move f4. Another move in the stone wall that you've got to watch out for. With this move, black undermines white's king side. OK, he gives white the centre, but he's going to get very active chances against the white king. Precisely the type of scenario which wins games at the lower level. You put your opponent's king under pressure, they wilt under this pressure. Knight f5. Well, OK, let's go back. I mean, clearly, if white takes the pawn on f4, black takes on h4, and black is in very good shape in this position. If white plays e5 here, knight takes e5, knight takes c6, bishop takes c6, rook takes e5, then queen f7 is bound to give black good chances. Well, I don't know. It's not that easy for White. I mean, even for a Grandmaster, defending positions of this type are not easy. Garcia Palermo chooses knight f5. Of course, that knight's got to be taken in view of the threat to the queen and mate on g7. But after queen d7, f6, and now rook f8, black plays his position very coolly indeed. It becomes clear that the white is overpressing. Actually, it's the white king that's going to come under fire in this position. Uh, it's hard for black to make progress, uh, hard for white to make progress in this position. He's, he's, his attack has come to a dead halt, and, um, well, black is getting ready to whip up chances himself by putting his queen on g4. So g takes f4 was played. Queen g4. Rook takes e8. Rook takes e8. Rook e1. And now black is happy to bail out by taking off the rooks 
and then taking on f6. So we've reached an endgame here where material is level, but the queen and knight represent a considerable danger to white. Black's queen is in a more active position. Black's knight effectively covers the king. And it's amazing in the stone wall how often white's light square bishop, which is touted to be the, the strongest piece quite often that white has, is almost meaningless here. White tries to activate this bishop by going b5. Well, black takes and then takes again. White moves in with a check, king g7, and then takes on b5 with his queen. There's an exchange on f4. Queen d7, queen c1 check, and now queen takes c5, queen takes b7. But with the action taking place on one side of the board, this is precisely the type of scenario where the bishop is completely dominated by the knight. The knight is a short range piece. It likes action solely confined to one side of the board because the knight can operate brilliantly at short range. And the bishop here is reduced to the role of defender. So this endgame is misery for white. He's a pawn down and his king is under fire. It remains for black to try and activate the knight. And this is his next task. OK, there's a bit of toing and froing with the queen. Then black plays f5. He wants to start giving checks on g4, which white covers by playing bishop f3. Black pins the bishop, white unpins, and now black is again onto the initiative straight away with queen d2 check, and now king f6. It's remarkable in this position how little uh, play white has in this position against the black king. I mean, the problem is the knight can just block checks, and um, it may well be that the endgame of knight and two against bishop and one is lost for white. So white tries bishop d5, hoping to block the black queen out. The queen gives a few checks to improve her position. There's no rush at all in this position to, to um, press ahead with black. And now comes knight d6. Queen a8. King e5. And now the king moves into f4. Again, white's hands are really tied in this position. He tries queen c6. If he goes queen a4 check, well then I think knight e4. And after bishop takes e4, simply queen takes e4 check, forces a one king a pawn ending. So white is conducting the most thankless task in chess. He's trying to make something out of nothing, uh, just purely defending in a position where his king is under fire, his material down as well. He's got nothing to look forward to. That is the problem with white's position. There's no counterplay and no hope. He's just got to continue and pray that black makes a mistake. Well, black doesn't make a mistake. He continues to torture white with moves like king e3. White plays h5, queen d2, check king h3. And black moves in again with king f2. Throughout this long endgame, white has been completely unable to improve his position. And of course, if we go back, we can see that the, the white queen is tied down, chained to the defence of her bishop on f3. That's why she can't give checks. Bishop g2, queen e3 check, and that was that. White decided to resign this position. Um, well, I mean, there's really nothing for him to play. If he goes king h4 in this position, then queen g3 is mate. If he goes king uh, to h2, we go queen g3, king h1, and then queen h4 check. Very simply winning the game. So another one of those stonewall games where, you know, White play, play We are seeing on this DVD plenty of examples of super grandmasters um, running aground, if you like, against the Stonewall formation. And uh, we're going to see another one now. This comes from the Aeroflot Open in 2003. Playing White in this game is Luke Van Whaley from Holland, 2668. And he's playing against M. Ulibin, graded 2581. Van Whaley plays plenty of approved moves here. B3, our old friend, Queen E7 to stop Bishop A3, Knight E5. And now Ulibin plays perhaps the most accurate move in this position, B6. It takes White a long time to exchange off dark square bishops in this line. Meanwhile, Black is preparing counterplay with, um, with Bishop B7 and then C5. Now, perhaps the most accurate move for White in this position is C takes D5. And then Bishop B2, Bishop B7, Queen C2. I think this is probably the most critical move order, and um, 
Black should probably beat it by simply playing his queen to e6. Um, I think after that, castles follows, followed by c5. Now, in this game, of course, Van Wey doesn't do that. He plays knight d2, bishop b7, bishop b2, and then black castles. Rook comes to c1, and then a5. The text move is very good. It restrains white's queenside ambitions, gains space, and makes room for the knight to come to a6. So the next plan of campaign for, for black is to bring his rooks to the centre, and then to get c5 in. Queen e2. Knight e4, and rook fd1, the most natural move in the world. Knight b1 was played in the game Matlack versus Grinfeld, Capel Legrand, 1997, and after c5, black was in very good shape. White gave the knight a boot, the knight came back and played knight c3, but black just brought his rooks into the centre, and, uh, well, white has no real advantage in the complicated position after knight b5, bishop b8. Black has completed his development, and um, of the two positions, I slightly prefer black. I would much rather white had not played f3 in this position. Black is in good shape. Going back to the game itself, Van Whaley versus Ulibin, we rejoin it with white playing rook fd1, and now black goes into action with c5. We've seen already that black must... Um, change his strategy if you like according to circumstances in the zone wall for the most part he plays with b6 aiming for c5 but he can as we've seen if white plays bishop f4 go with bishop e8 and then bishop uh, h5 knight b1 perhaps um, white has some ideas of putting his knight on b5 knight a3 and then knight b5 well, black doesn't seem concerned about this at all. He plays knight b4. And after f3, knight takes a2. Now, if black had retreated with knight f6, then knight c3 would put white's plan into effect. Planning a3, and then knight b5. But knight takes a2 is a different animal altogether. And um, black is happy to sacrifice two minor pieces for a rook and two pawns here. He takes on c1 and then takes on e4, producing a, a situation which is actually quite difficult to assess properly. Uh, yes, white does have two minor pieces here, but rook and two pawns are a formidable force, and uh, there's only one open file, which black is currently occupying. So, how can I assess this position? Very unclear. It's one of those positions where unclear is the, exactly the right word to describe it. And whoever plays best in this position is going to win. Well, white plays correctly for the time being. He brings his knight into the nice outpost, b5. And with the knight finding this good square, it's time for black to open some lines for the rooks. The way to play these positions when you've got the rooks is to open up files for the rooks. So this is exactly what black does. He trades on d4, he trades on e5, he trades on c4. The black rook comes into the game on the d file. Bishop a3. Looks dangerous, but black is ready for it. Rook takes d1, check. And then rook d8. Queen f1. Clearly, bishop takes e7, check, will be very unpromising indeed. After rook takes d1, check. King f2. And then c, ta uh, c takes b3. I think white is losing this position, really. I, I really don't see any way back from here. The pass pawns on the queen side are bound to tell. So after rook d8, white went queen f1, queen d7, remember this, bring in the major pieces onto open files, this is the way to play. b takes c4 by, by, by Van Whaley. Black now has two passed pawns, but with white's pieces ready to pounce on d6, shutting the black major pieces out of the game, it really is time for black to move in for the kill. And with e3, Black is trying to soften up the white king. Bishop takes b7, queen takes b7, knight d6, shutting the rook out of the game. Queen d7, queen f3, and now black plays queen a4. Very unclear indeed. Queen f7 in this position. Black parks his king in the corner. What next for white? 
White has to contend with Queen D1 check and Black's passed E pawn. So after Queen A4, White went Queen G4. H6, Queen takes E6 check. King H7, Queen F5 check. King G8, and perhaps now this game should end in a draw. After Queen F5 check, King G8. But Van Wady gets ambitious. Um, the problem with this position is that optically, White looks as though he should be winning. He's got two minor pieces, he's got a pass pawn, he's got what looks like a big attack. But it may just be that this position is no more than a draw, and White should take it with Queen F7. Instead, Van Wady comes up with Queen D3. And after E2, White is suddenly in trouble. He's gone over the top in this position. If he goes queen takes e2, queen takes a3. If he plays king f2, as in the game, black has queen d1. Perhaps this situation was um, exacerbated or prompted by some sort of time trouble. It certainly looks that way. Then while he played queen d5 check, king h8, knight f7 check, king h7, queen e4 check, g6. And the problem is, white is out of steam. He may well have been out of time, because the game concluded at this point. Well, actually, there's not a lot for white to do in this position, so perhaps this was a legitimate resignation. It's hard to tell at the distance of five, six years. But, um, well, looking at this position, white is out of checks. Black's threat, queen f1 check. He's not really to be denied, unless white goes in for queen takes e2, after which rook d2. Is very conclusive. So not a game that White should have lost, but again a very unclear struggle all the way through, and Black was you know in there fighting. It's now time to turn our attention to uh, lines where White goes knight h3, which is traditionally supposed to be uh, a slightly better way for White to handle the stone wall formation. However, Black can get good chances against this line as long as he knows what he's doing. The point is that the knight can come to a very effective square in this line on f4. Moreover, the action of the bishop on g2 is not unimpeded. Therefore, white can maybe follow with f3 and then pawn up to e4 uh, more quickly than is otherwise the case when the knight's on f3. I think black should continue traditionally with castles and bishop d6. And now we're going to look at a game from Ramat Hasharon in 1992 between Zoltan Varga and Dof Zivroni, where a very unorthodox stone wall developed after knight d2 and now pawn to h6. This is very unusual, but um, it is possible in this line uh, where black is thinking about shutting the knight out of the game by going g5. This is a much more direct approach than we're used to in the stone wall, and it's a very aggressive one too. Well, uh, Varga brought his knight into the game straight away, and black snapped off that knight, followed by castles. It turns out that although white doesn't play c4 in this game, black is able to transfer play back into something we've already seen, the idea that having weakened the pawns on the king side with bishop that takes f4, he's now going to bring his bishop into the game via e8 and um, hope to take advantage of the weakened white king side by these means. Well, white plays f3. Black plays knight bd7, white goes knight d3, uh, declining the possible exchange, and now both sides put their king in the corner, as a prelude, perhaps, to action on the g-file. Rook g8, a two-way move, both defensive, and possibly threatening g5. Queen e1, rook c8, black gives himself the additional option of c5 in this game. Queen f2, and now knight f8. Rook g1, rook c7, black manoeuvres well in this game. He brings his other rook across to the king side for a possible attack. Queen comes to h4, rook h7 defending, queen goes back to f2, and now black more or less offers a draw by going rook hg7, and I think that would probably be the natural course of events. Black has defended well. Yes, white does have a grip on uh, e5, but his dark square bishop is unimpressive. Probably white should take the draw after queen h4. But as quite often happens in the stone wall, the white player misassesses his chances, plays on for the win, 
and gets into trouble. Well, okay, the play continues here. Black is holding white at bay here. It remains for white to try and open up this position and justify his decision to play on. Varga plays e4. Okay, this is the critical move. Black takes and goes knight f6. Suddenly, it turns out that white's aggression is rebounding on him. Black's knight is able to hop in to the beautiful square e4. And now comes the thematic advance g5. Suddenly white's aggression on the king side is turned on its head. And after h takes g5, it's black who has any attack that's going. He's threatening g4 in this position. And uh, the white rooks are successfully being held at bay. c4. Bishop g6, black is able to activate his hitherto dormant light square bishop. Bishop b4, queen d8, rook e2, and black plays rook d7. Bishop d6 is the only way white can find to shut out black's pressure. And black goes rook g7, there's no need to take this bishop right away. Knight c5 was played, knight takes c5, d takes c5. Is that bishop on d6 strong? Or is it just an overgrown pawn? Well, black manages to play on the king side. Move around this bishop. Play without the dark square bishop if you like. And this is very decisive. Because, uh, well, the bishop on d6 never gets the chance to come back into the game now. Bishop comes to f5. Bishop g4. Bishop takes g4. Rook takes g4. Queen e8. And white resigned. White's... Uh, Paralysed here, the black queen is getting ready to take part in the fray via h5 and g6. White overestimated his chances, as he so often does in the stone wall. Another 2480 biting the dust. My next game is a rather unusual one. It's um, an email correspondence game, which was played in 2006 in a match, international match, between the United States and Norway. Playing white in this game is Daniel M. Fleetwood, graded 2565 on the correspondence rating scale. And playing black, Ivor Byrne, Grandmaster of Correspondence from Norway, graded 2616. And it's uh, a good example of how black should defend himself in a tough fashion against this um, difficult knight h3 line. Well, here we see black setting up the, uh, the normal formation and white coming in to exchange off the dark square bishops. Of course, it takes white a little bit more time in this line to dominate e5 as his knight is um, out on the edge of the board, if you like. So black declines the exchange of dark square bishops for the time being, retreating his bishop to e7. Knight d2. Of course, black is trying to justify this time by arguing that the bishop on f4 and the knight on h3 are tripping over each other's toes in this position. They're both fighting for the same square. Um, Black's loss of time is also justified by the uh, length of time it takes white to get that knight on h3 back into the game. Well, knight a6, a3, and now Byrne plays h6. He played this twice in 2006 in correspondence. We're going to see another example of a game he played against the strong uh, Grandmaster Zagorskis in a minute, graded 2539, where black also got a stable position using this move h6. And to a degree, h6 is very logical. g5 is a good move here. It expands. It keeps that knight on h3 out of the game. Yes, white is able to come into e5 with his bishop. But now knight g4. And this is the passing of the ways. In Fleetwood burn, Fleetwood played queen to c3. Allowing black to take on e5 straight away. In Zagorskis burn, White decided to play e3. And black just played bishop d7. White went queen c3, so something similar. And after that, black played queen e8. f4. And queen g6. Retaining the integrity of the pawn structure on the queen side, on the king side. I think it would be unwise for black to block with g4 in this position. Knight comes back to f2. Uh, this block position suits the white knights more than it does the black bishops. And... Um, not clear to me how black's going to activate that bishop on d7. 
So it's better to keep the tension with queen g6 and then go rook a c8. Zagorski shut things down with c5 and only now did Byrne go g4 because he's got a clear idea in mind. He wants to open up the h file with h5 and then h4. Queen d3. This is a pretty uh, solid position for both players. Knight comes back to d1. King goes to g7. Rook comes across to h8. And Byrne was able to mass his major pieces in the h-file by playing rook h6 and rook dh8. Knight e d4. Queen e8. Rook a b1. Rook 8 h7. Knight d2. Knight c7. And this rather solid game now ended in a draw. That was Zagorski's burn, a game which straddled three years. Took place between the years of 2006 and 2008. And a draw, I think, is a fair result. Of course, over the board, there's no reason why you shouldn't play this position on for a win with either colour. But black is OK here. Which takes us back to the game Fleetwood versus Burn, where you'll recall white played queen c3 and black snapped off the bishop straight away. Byrne then played rook f7 and got to grips with the problem of the queenside development after f4 and then b6. Rook fd1 and Byrne played a5. b takes a5. Rook takes a5. Quite helpful to black this as he's now able to mount pressure against the white a pawn. White tries to take away some of the pressure. So black moves rook c5. The rook is quite safe on this square, given that white doesn't have a dark square bishop. Queen b3. And now b5. If there was any possible problem for black on the queen side looming, then with this move, black liquidates the queen side and actually rids himself of any problems there. a5. White seems to be playing for a win. Bishop d7. Black says, OK, if you want to push that pawn, push it. The further it comes up the board, the weaker it becomes. Fleetwood tries to address the problem of his offside knight. And now black blockades the pawn with knight a6. Knight d3. G takes f4. Very creative uh, exchange sacrifice here. After knight takes c5, black is going knight takes c5. And then he will take on e3 on the next turn, opening up distinct prospects for his dark square bishop. So Fleetwood decides to keep things stable with e takes f4. Black retreats. Queen b2. And now Byrne reminds Fleetwood that he's got a pass pawn of his own to push. I think it's essentially due to the stonewall pawn formation in the centre, Black is in very good shape here. He's also getting ready to activate this light square bishop with the possibility of bishop b5 sometime in the very near future. White blockades. Black moves in with his rook. And white brings his knight to the dream square, d4. Queen c7. King h1 and now queen a7, hoping to budge that very strong white knight on d4. Knight e1. Knight c5. Queen takes b4. And black has calculated this well. He wanted to answer queen takes b4 with knight e4. Queen b6, knight f2 check, queen takes b6 coming, and now knight takes d1. What has white got to show against this plan? Well, Fleetwood went b7, that was his idea. And after rook f8, he's going in with rook a8. Fortunately for Byrne, he's got the effective counter here, rook c, c8. And after rook takes c8, rook takes c8. The two players agreed to a draw. An exciting and well contested game. Why a draw? Well, after b takes c8, check. Bishop takes c8. It's a very balanced position. Symmetrical, three minor pieces each. A draw seems a perfectly fair result. So, Byrne showed in this game that even after knight h3, the stone wall formation is very stable and black can play this position. I think when white puts a knight on h3, watch out for this move g5, um, which uh, keeps the knight out of the game and gives black opportunities on the king side. 
I think what we've learned on this DVD is that the Stonewall is a very stable opening. It can be played at all levels with the hope of success. White finds it really difficult to play against this black pawn formation. I've only concentrated on the lines with G3 in this DVD because I think that is the main line, that is the true stone wall. To finish up with a couple of recent games, and this next one comes from the Cutro Open, played in April 2009. And it's a typical club player's game if you like. The player with white is only 2020, Elo. His name is Kai Neubauer, and he's playing against Francesco Bentivegna, who's graded 2-3-2-6. And um, again, it's one of those games where white plays all the recommended moves, but completely fails to dent black's solid position. Knight BD2, well this has been you know, uh, a recommended move, Petrosian's move uh, for a long, long time. Uh, black plays Knight BD7, B3, castles, Bishop B2. And in this game, black plays very straightforwardly with knight e4. Obviously, black could play b6. I think if he's going to play with b6, it's better to leave the knight on b8 at home. But in this game, black shows another approach, which is perfectly viable against the white setup. He brings his other knight into f6, and then his bishop comes out to d7. The bishop reroutes to e8, and after knight e5, Medivenia put his bishop out on h5. So, a little bit time-consuming this manoeuvre, yes, but, you know, a very pointed way to put pressure on White's position. And now White's got to ask himself the question, do I want to play f3 or not? I'm not so sure he does. I think after f3, uh, Black will be in perfectly good shape here after Knight takes d2. And if Queen takes d2, Black could even consider Bishop takes e5 and then Knight d7. Something similar happens in the game. And... Um, White has nothing in this position at all. The bishop on a3, the bishop on b2 is, is not very impressive. And black has plenty of counterplay. So um, I think bishop h5 secures black equal chances. Well, Neubauer went bishop f3. Knight takes d2. There are a couple of exchanges. And now black happily put his knight into e4. White moved his rook. And now g5. You can see... With the exchange of a couple of pairs of minor pieces, black's position has become very easy indeed. Well, white went knight e5. I think the main idea of that is to get rid of the black knight by playing f3. So black moves him with f g4 to uh, dissuade f3. White goes through with the move anyway, but now there are a couple more exchanges on f3 and then on e5. Black is playing for the better endgame, and he hopes to leave himself with the better minor piece. Now, White's next move, of course, is forced. If he takes on c4, I think White can look forward to nothing after knight d2. Except a very bad position. <laughs> so, White goes rook d1, queen e7, and only now does he take on c4. But you can see, Black's knight on e4 is the boss of the show. It's much better than White's bishop on b2. And um, Black is dominating. More pieces come off the board. After rook c d4, c5. In fact, the rooks come off. Thank you very much, says Black. My queen and knight are now an incredibly strong attacking force. You have to defend against my idea of queen d2, which white does. But Black brings his queen up to d5, an equally impressive post. And now, of course, Black's main idea is knight g5. White plays g4. He's getting desperate. Knight g5 happened anyway. h4... And now knight, G, knight f3 check was just a very good move. Black moves him for the kill. F takes g4. And then h5. So out of nowhere, and seemingly, you know, just by playing obvious moves, White has slipped into a terrible position. If it can happen to this guy, it can certainly happen to your opponents. It's definitely my impression that the stone wall is more difficult to play for White than it is for Black. I mean, these games prove it conclusively. Maybe at the Super Grandmaster level... You know, these guys know what they're doing. But we've seen grandmasters on this DVD going down left, right and centre to the stone wall. So it can't be that easy. Well, knight g5 concluded this well-played game. White's material behind is king's facing the firing squad. Black is defended against any white threats that uh, happen to be in the position. Neubauer resigned. 
Well, my final game comes from the uh, Olomouc International Master Tournament, um, played in August 2009. It's a game between Benty Bjorn, who's graded 2-2-5-2, and Robert Tibensky, graded 2-4-1-8. And it's a line where White plays Queen to C2. This doesn't appreciably change the nature of the position. The nice thing about the stone wall is you don't need to remember long move sequences or get involved in heavy theory. It's all about ideas. White's trying to dominate the centre with, with knight e5. Black expands on the queen side with b6. And uh, when the white queen is on c2, this approach of, of developing the queen side makes a lot more sense. Because the idea is when c5 comes, often there's a black rook on the c-file, and then the white queen is precisely in the wrong place. So white tries to intercept black's long-term plan of development with bishop b7, uh, knight bd7, then c5 in a moment, by taking on d5. This is a legitimate way to play. Uh, and now white plays knight to d3. Alright, bishop comes to b7. Knight c3. And Tibensky shows an independent uh, flavour by playing knight c6. Now he's hitting the move, he's hitting d4. And he might be threatening knight b4, exchanging off white's central knight. So white goes queen to a4. Alright, a6. Not sure at all what White's early Queen of Ventures have achieved here and Benty returned back to base with Queen D1. So this is another typical example of, of White playing normal moves against the stone wall but getting nothing. Of course Black has to defend uh, E6 in this position and he does so with Rook E8 which is slightly unusual in this position. It's normal to defend with the Queen you would think but Black has more active intentions for his Queen. He wants to put that queen on b6 and then complete his development with rook a c8. So a very, very satisfactory stonewall position for black here. All his pieces in good play. And now he's thinking about expanding on the queen side with a5 and then bishop a6. This would be a good way to bring the light square bishop into the game. So white has achieved nothing from the opening yet again. And um, really he could not have been too happy with his position after bishop a6. A model deployment for black and... Um, well, there are problems looming with the pin coming on the long diagonal a6 to f1. So rook c1, knight b4. Black could equally have chosen b4, but I don't think he wanted to allow the white knight to come to a4. Knight takes b4, bishop takes b4, knight e2. Bishop came back to d6. Of course, it's much easier for black to take the initiative on the queen side in this position. White's a little bit gummed up. His queen's gummed up. His, um, his rook on f1 is gummed up. He gets out of the potential pin with rook e1, and then he goes f3. He thinks he's going to get some play together with perhaps e4, or maybe he was just cutting out knight e4 by black. g5, an interesting and ambitious move. Um, well, g5, the first point is to cut the white knight out of f4. Later on, black is thinking about g4, which undermines white's control of e4. So, all sorts of positional ideas with this one move and of course white can't take advantage of this slight weakening of the black king side because well how's he going to get his queen out to h5 for instance that would be the only move which could possibly take advantage of the g5 move white's miles away from playing that move so queen d2 h6 protecting that pawn carefully and now white tries to bail out by exchanging off all the rooks black is happy to do that and now comes the undermining move i mentioned earlier g4. With this move that gets the opportunity to bring his knight into the game with effect. Obviously going back white could have blocked this position by going f4 but I really don't think he liked the prospects of his bishops after that. Uh, both the white bishops are really not in very good shape at all and uh, at some stage in the very near future black is thinking about knight e4. Black can also play on the queen side with moves like queen c6 and a4. So black would have all the play if black if white blocked. Added to which, there's also an idea of h5, h4. So, plenty of ideas for black, but not a lot for white to, to play for after the block. So, going back to g4, that's why white takes. He's willing to allow the black knight into the game in return for some play after bishop f3. Knight f6. e4. White thinks he sees an opportunity here. g5. 
due to an attack on h6. D takes e4. Queen takes h6. Looks dangerous for a moment, but black has got it all under control. He finds the excellent move. Bishop e5. Both defending the knight and attacking the pawn at d4. And also, black's king is escaping after the checks by white's queen. Bishop e2. Bishop takes d4, check. Bishop takes d4. Queen takes d4. Some more exchanges happen after bishop takes e2. And now, the move I think white have missed. Queen f2, check. By force, black transposes into a winning knight endgame after knight takes h6. Knight endgames are very similar to pawn endings. Here, um, yes, white does have some hope with his outside pass pawn. But black has extra pawns in this position. And as soon as he can get the central pawns mobilised, that will be that. White hastens the, hastens the end, really, by playing g4. But in the long run, black is just going to play f4. He's going to prepare f4. Possibly he can bring his king to g5. Or maybe he can just play uh, knight f6 and then knight d5. f4 in the long run cannot be stopped. So white tries to bring things to a head by playing g4. Now, of course, he's got two pass pawns. But, you know, this position is probably lost. Black can always make a dent in those pawns. I mean, the immediate plans just to transfer the king up to h4. So white plays a3, again trying to disturb the nature of the position here. His, uh, his idea is to bring the knight to c3. Black goes knight f6 and then g5. After knight h5, white played h4. King e6, king e2, e3. And then white resigned. OK, white sowed the seeds of his own downfall in this knight ending. But it was probably lost. I mean, white was trying to take emergency measures against uh, against black's projected pawn advance. In the end, he just hastened defeat. But there was no doubt about it throughout this game. You know, black had a very good position. This brings us to the end of our short investigation into the stone wall. Um, I've chosen an approach which features illustrative games rather than an examination of theory. I don't think the stone wall can be studied in that manner. I think it's a stable variation. I don't think it's easy for white to play against the stone wall and that you can use it with success in your games and moreover, more or less straight away. Well, that's about it for now and I sincerely hope you enjoyed our little investigation. If I can help you to improve your results, then I will be very happy indeed. Until we meet again, this is Andrew Martin signing off. Goodbye and good luck. I think what we've learned on this DVD is that the stone wall is a very stable opening. It can be played at all levels with the hope of success. White finds it really difficult to play against this black pawn formation. I've only concentrated on the lines with G3 in this DVD because I think that is the main line, that is the true stone wall. To finish up with a couple of recent games, and this next one comes from the Cutro Open, played in April 2009. And it's a typical club player's game, if you like. The player with white is only 2020 Elo. His name is Kai Neubauer, and he's playing against Francesco Bentivegna, who's graded 2326. And um, again, it's one of those games where white plays all the recommended moves, but completely fails to dent black's solid position. Knight BD2, well this has been you know, uh, a recommended move, Petrosian's move uh, for a long, long time. Uh, black plays Knight BD7, B3, castles, Bishop B2. And in this game, Black plays very straightforwardly with Knight E4. Obviously Black could play B6. I think if he's going to play with B6, it's better to leave the Knight on B8 at home. But in this game, Black shows another approach which is perfectly viable against the white setup. He brings his other knight into f6, and then his bishop comes out to d7. The bishop reroutes to e8, and after knight e5, Medivenia put his bishop out on h5. So, a little bit time consuming this manoeuvre, yes, but, you know, a very pointed way to put pressure on white's position. And now white's got to ask himself the question, do I want to play f3 or not? I'm not so sure he does. I think after f3, uh, black will be in perfectly good shape here after knight takes d2. And if queen takes d2, black could even consider bishop takes e5 and then knight d7. Something similar happens in the game. And um, 
White has nothing in this position at all. The bishop on a3, the bishop on b2 is, is not very impressive. And black has plenty of counterplay. So um, I think bishop h5 secures black equal chances. Well, Neubauer went bishop f3. Knight takes d2. There are a couple of exchanges. And now black happily put his knight into e4. White moves his rook. And now g5. You can see, with the exchange of a couple of pairs of minor pieces, black's position has become very easy indeed. Well, white went knight e5. I think the main idea of that is to get rid of the black knight by playing f3. So black moves him with f g4 to uh, dissuade f3. White goes through with the move anyway, but now there are a couple more exchanges on f3 and then on e5. Black is playing for the better endgame, and he hopes to leave himself with a better minor piece. Now, that White's next move, of course, is forced. If he takes on c4, I think White can look forward to nothing after knight d2. Except a very bad position. <laughs> so, White goes rook d1, queen e7, and only now does he take on c4. But you can see, black's knight on e4 is the boss of the show. It's much better than White's bishop on b2. And... Um, Black is dominating. More pieces come off the board. After rook c d4, c5. In fact, the rooks come off. Thank you very much, says Black. My queen and knight are now an incredibly strong attacking force. You have to defend against my idea of queen d2, which white does. But black brings his queen up to d5. An equally impressive post. And now, of course, black's main idea is knight g5. White plays g4, he's getting desperate. Knight g5 happened anyway. h4, and now knight, G, knight f3 check was just a very good move. Black moves him for the kill. f takes g4, and then h5. So out of nowhere, and seemingly, you know, just by playing obvious moves, White has slipped into a terrible position. If it can happen to this guy, it can certainly happen to your opponents. It's definitely my impression that the stone wall is more difficult to play for white than it is for black. I mean, these games prove it conclusively. Maybe at the Super Grandmaster level, you know, these guys know what they're doing. But we've seen Grandmasters on this DVD going down left, right and centre to the stone wall. So it can't be that easy. Well, Knight G5 concluded this well-played game. White's material behind is King's facing the firing squad. Black has defended against any white threats that uh, happen to be in the position. Neubauer resigned.